This is MJ. I'm an author, I'm an artist, I'm an analyzer. You can find all my work at mjmunoz.com. Welcome to Skimming Leaves. This is a uh, sub-episode, sub-series of Story of Everything, and in this episode I'm going to be talking about Harry Potter Book 4, Goblet of Fire. So, to start it off, I'm going to give you some fun facts about the book, and then I will uh, let my... I, I will hand things off to my past self to discuss my thoughts on the book right after finishing it. Like, minutes after I finished the book, I was sharing my thoughts on it. So, you'll get to hear that. <laughs> Excuse me. So, uh, book the book was published July 8, 2000. Uh, 2000. Uh, Scholastic in the U.S. and Bloomsbury, apparently, which is a, a thing that publishes books in uh, the U.K., uh, published them simultaneously. There was also a midnight release of the book in the year 2000, you know, when it was released. I believe I've mentioned this before, but I vaguely remember my sister going to a midnight release. It may have been for this book, because this, you know, book four was the first one to get a midnight release, and then apparently five, six, and seven all got midnight releases as well, and yeah, I had no idea what this was, but obviously, you know, there's people outside of America, and there are people who weren't me, I was like 13, um, you know, who had been reading you know, these books and other books at the time, and we're excited about this thing. So that's kind of crazy to think there was a midnight release, and like it's a it's burned in my mind that my sister and her friend went to this store for the release of a book at midnight, and I just thought that's that's crazy. How do you do that? And uh, now it's interesting. You know, all these years later, I'm finding out that it was a uh, it was a thing that happened, and you know, apparently it happened with Goblet of Fire. So that's kind of kind of neat. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, there's according to this is so funny. The word count is approximately 190,637, which I don't know how you do that. And apparently the UK and American uh, or US versions of them are different. Uh, the UK comes in at 636 pages and the US is at 734. Is that because the font size is different? Is it because the uh, size of the books is different generally? I know there's different cuts of paper from all around the world. Um, if you've ever messed around with a printer, you'll see uh, you know, all these different sizes for you know, printing out documents. So maybe that's what that's about. And um, I think, let me see, some about the Triwizard Tournament here, Fleur de Liqueur, Victor Crumb, Mad Eye Moody, these characters were introduced, uh, as well as Barty Crouch Jr. Uh, although I thought both Crouches Jr. and Sr. were introduced here, but maybe that's a spoiler. I can't remember now. So I won't dwell on it. Don't think about the spoilers. And... <coughs> What else? What else? Um, there's a bunch of romance in this book, which I will talk about later. And uh, I guess that's a fun fact. Uh, let me see. What else? Yeah, I think that's about it for the fun facts that I'm going to share, because the rest of these aren't as fun as they could be. And I don't want to bring you to, bring you down. I don't want to harsh your mellow. So anyway, uh, yeah, this was a good book, and I enjoyed it a lot. And there's lots I have to say about it, and I'll let you hear what all that is. It has been moments since I have finished listening to the audiobook of J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter and... Hold on, let me, it'll come to me. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you which book number it is, because it'll be funnier this way. Oh, The Goblet of Fire. Yes, so that's book four. And I thought it was interesting. I was shocked by the fact that the first Harry Potter book was seven hours long, and the fourth had exploded, bloomed, blossomed, inflated like Aunt Margaret, to be a 20-hour-long book. However, unlike Aunt Margaret, um, every bit of it was welcome and enjoyable <laughs> to experience. I don't know why I'm using that metaphor. It's really weird, and I do apologize, but uh, I can't go back now, so we're just going to move forward. That's all we can do. Uh, so... I liked the book. I was shocked by it. There were a lot of interesting twists and turns, and uh, I, I don't want to spoil, so I'll just say it like this. The last hour or so, which was, I think, the last two chapters, uh, eh, two plus, um, was interesting because it was basically a... <laughs> it was like a reverse heist, or it was like a the... The bad guy had done a heist, basically, and we got to unravel and see 
flowing backwards from the point at which the bad guy had achieved victory yeah, had achieved victory how that all came together and all the work that went into it and it was really interesting for me because I thought that The Prisoner of Azkaban had a little bit of an aspect of it not like a heist but like a mystery and we really got to unravel that mystery in the end of the book in the last leg of the book however much you know whatever percentage that uh, whatever percentage that equates to which I, I'm not going to guess in the bomb books uh, The Wizard of Oz it's always like 75% through there's a turn uh, for the positive and then the heroes has a, have a triumphant march or a triumphant uh, campaign where they just like are <laughs> they're like mowing through things for the last quarter of the book and then it just ends suddenly at like 99.9% of the book it's like and it's over um, however that is not what happened here and I do think it's so uh, touching back on Baum briefly uh, all of the Wizard of Oz books the 14 original L. Frank Baum Wizard of Oz books that is are about four hours long I think they're all 20 to 24 chapters I knew it better when I was I went on a spurt or on a, a marathon basically where I was downing those like every couple days um, one of those a day basically every every day or so um, so I, I saw the formula and I understood it better and I can't remember if it's 20 or 24 chapters but it's one of the two or it's somewhere between them and it's very consistent It's the chapters are pretty consistently about 10 minutes long in some books you have a 5 minute chapter and a 15 minute chapter not necessarily back to back but somewhere in and around each other and it all balances out to about 10 minutes a chapter and about well no because they're 4 hour books how does that work I don't know maybe I'm wrong maybe they're closer to 15 minute chapters but regardless we're talking about Harry Potter here and Rowling's work not Baum's work but I was really surprised uh, I don't know if I mentioned this last time that Rowling writes long chapters uh, a la Tolkien I, I, I don't like Tolkien's long chapters I'm, I am I kind of got spoiled entering into the uh, British fantasy authors uh, books uh, by reading the Chronicles of Narnia and enjoying how Lewis kept them consistent <laughs> and uh, paced a certain way and then I went to The Hobbit or yeah I went to The Hobbit and I said of the first chapter to myself this is a 45 minute long chapter how is that possible but apparently it is and it's something that other authors do Uh, again it's something Rowling does here and uh, it's interesting because while it all took a long time this is supposed to be encapsulating about a year you know 10 months of these characters lives so you know this is a 20 hour book 10 months that's 2 hours a month basically that works Two hours a month, that's uh, 30 minutes a week. That makes sense. If you watch a, a TV show every week, you know, that could be a 30 minute experience, approximately. Um, so that's very understandable. It, you know, it makes sense. And there were how many? There were 32, 33, maybe 34 chapters. Um, again, that's fairly reasonable. Um, but I, I, I was surprised by how long the book is. And, and again, I'm trying not to, you know, go into too many details of the book. This is supposed to be casual and kind of spoiler free and whet your appetite for the book so I don't want to go into too much of it but uh, I yeah I'm putting a button or a bow on that I'm surprised how long the book is however the length of the book is enjoyable and I don't think it overstays its welcome at all and actually towards at like 70% like 17 hours in I was thinking alright this is getting a little long well there were two things actually around 15 to 16 hours I thought how are they going to put two more tasks in here? I, I won't hide the fact that the Goblet of Fire is about this, you know, a something it's about. Part of what it's about is this Triwizard Tournament where these other two wizarding schools from somewhere somewhere in France and maybe somewhere in Germany, Bulgaria, Russia, I don't know. Um, they come along and they have some of their class, uh, uh, the fourth year, fifth year, I don't know what. Uh, I think it's the fifth years. Um some of their fifth year class at uh, Hogwarts for most of the year Uh, and during that time there's a competition called the Triwizard Tournament that features three tasks or uh, ordeals, trials, however you want to call it that each of the wizards from the school is supposed to be uh, you know, conquering and at the end of it whoever, you know, gets the most points will win the Triwizard Cup win the Triwizard Tournament and there's prestige for the school and the student and there's also money for the student 
Uh, however, what's strange about this year's Triwizard Tournament is that Harry is a fourth year. He should be age-restricted from getting in, and he actually is in the uh, the tournament as a fourth champion. Uh, they're called champions. And he's not supposed to be there. And his uncle, or his father, his godfather, uh, is worried about him and thinks that he's putting his life in danger and that somebody's trying to kill him through doing, uh, by having him entered into the uh, Triwizard Tournament. And uh, it's interesting because Harry's a little flippant. So I'll talk about Harry for a little bit. Um, it's interesting to me that he is a little flippant and cavalier about the fact that death is on the line and uh, he makes the classic blunder of underestimating how serious that is for himself. And I'm sorry. I shouldn't laugh at my own jokes like that. Um, he makes the, uh, the foolish mistake of underestimating how serious the stakes are and he really doesn't take things seriously. I do enjoy that this comes back because I, I ended up telling uh, my eldest about this. I said, I can't believe what an idiot Harry is. Although, I kind of I don't understand the, the concept of the idiot protagonist or the idiot hero. Um, yeah, whatever. I, I'm, I'm not into this anymore. This is a part of my past life. But uh, Ash from the Evil Dead series or the Army of Darkness is where I was introduced to him and that's the most benign um, and that's where this really comes to the fore. He's an idiot, um, but he's really good at killing these deadites, these monsters that he has to fight and that kind of makes up for it. Um, you kind of enjoy seeing him get kicked around and beat around, though, and then ultimately having a victory. Not because you're cheering for him, but because it's fun to watch him get kicked around, uh, which is weird. Um, and that's mostly, I think, Sam Raimi's... Uh, that's from him. And uh, anyway, that's kind of odd. But uh, I'm, I enjoy Tokusatsu. I enjoy Power Rangers. There's a lot of idiot Red Rangers, especially in Super Sentai, I would say. They're like dumbly optimistic in uh, the American versions, in the Power Rangers versions, I would say. Um, or, like, they just, like, don't make sense, but everybody goes along with them, like, that guy's the leader, even though Black Ranger or Blue Ranger or whoever should be the leader instead. But in Super Sentai, they're almost literally idiot uh, protagonists. And in uh, other Japanese media, in the shonen manga, or shonen manga and, and anime, you also have an idiot protagonist, hero, who for some reason, even though he doesn't try hard enough, he doesn't work at it hard enough. He doesn't study. He doesn't whatever. The power of friendship and his tenacity and optimism make him so that he's more powerful than the Dark Lord who spent, uh, you know, decades honing his craft and his evil and sacrificing everything. And then this guy comes along and uh, is able to fumble through things because he's got a good attitude. He's able to overcome all challenges. And it, it doesn't make any sense. It, it, it uh, strains credulity. And there's a little bit of that with Harry. And... It's a little odd, but after after a certain point, he does start taking things more seriously. Coming up to the third trial, really, he takes things seriously. But it's funny, because even the villain, who I explained, we get this reverse heist explanation from this villain, um, he explains, yeah, I was worried about you, that you're such an idiot, Harry, that you were going to spoil all my plans, so I had to do all these things to orchestrate you coming out on top of this trial. And I thought that was delightful and hilarious. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I really I really dug it. Um, it is interesting, though, that he did have that turnaround towards the, the third one. So there is this maturity going with Harry, uh, even though he was in a weird place for a lot of this book. And I guess, you know, he's 14 years old. Uh, to me, that's no excuse. But then again, um, I was... Uh, I, I was more of a Hermione than a Ron or a Harry at 14, even though I was not a Hermione. So, um, yeah, that's that's kind of interesting. Okay, because I don't want these to be too long, I think I'm just going to touch on three more things. Romance, Hermione, and media. So, hopefully I remember those quite well. Romance, Hermione, media. Romance, Hermione, media. Okay, here we go. So, on the subject of romance... I do not appreciate the fact that this uh, wizarding world full of all sorts of, you know, supernatural, ridiculous things has to include uh, romance for children. Uh, I am not naive to the fact that kids uh, like each other and quote-unquote date and definitely fall in love at young, tender ages. 
<laughs> I have anecdotal experience and I have eyewitness experience as well. So, yeah, there's no doubt that that does happen. However, I do not need it in my fiction and I think my children certainly do not need it in their fiction and I think you can easily go by for three books without mentioning anything like that. And if you can do it for three, you can certainly do it for four. So, I'm a little disappointed or irritated, frustrated with the you know, nascent romances that Rowling put into uh, this book for whatever strange reason. And I'm not casting aspersions or saying she's doing anything ridiculous or like, you know, out of the norm for your standard... <laughs> your standard modern day author, I'll just call it that. But, um, I think... Uh, people would accuse me of being a little more prosaic if I'm using that word properly, and uh, I'm definitely more traditional, and uh, therefore, that's not necessary in this kind of thing. Um, and besides, the fans are going to do that for you, so you don't have to worry about it. Um, I was impressed, in fact, last book that things never, that there was never really hints at a romance between Hermione and either Ron or Harry, and when they got into their fight Ron and Harry in uh oh I guess that's this book whoops spoilers um well they end up getting having a confrontation and uh spending time apart from each other Ron and, her, and uh Harry in this book and uh I'm happy that it wasn't over Hermione there there is not a love triangle or any weird sort of romance thing going on between the three of them which I think is wonderful so it's commendable in some ways, but uh, not so commendable in other ways. And I don't think Rowling dwelled on it overly long, as some children's authors are willing and excited to do, which seems really weird to me. Um, but anyway, uh, <laughs> I don't want to go on for that with that for too much longer. Um, there was a Hagrid has a romantic interest in the book. It's a it doesn't go well. Like most things for Hagrid, it does not go how he planned. And that's kind of funny and kind of interesting, but it's also understandable. Uh, we also get to see Hagrid get drunk in one of these books. I think it was in the last book. And actually, I thought it, he, he should have gotten drunk in Azkaban, but he, I think he got drunk in um, Chamber of Secrets. Anyway, uh, regardless, the kids see him drunk, and it's not a big deal. And I'm okay with that. That makes a little more sense to me than... It makes more sense to me to have an adult romance and an adult getting drunk in a children's book than it does to have an adult romance witnessed by these kids and then also have kid romances in the same book. I don't know if that makes sense to you, but I'm drawing a parallel and saying this makes sense and this is good and acceptable, whereas this other thing doesn't make as much sense to me and is less acceptable or at least objectionable. So... Again, that's my opinion. You don't have to have my opinion. You don't have to agree. But I think the book would have worked just fine without those undertones and maybe even uh, the accusations made uh, around that subject would have been fine to have if it wasn't directly explored through the characters' perspectives. I'd be okay with that. So, anyway, uh, that is all I want to say about that subject, which was romance. Uh, then I think it was Hermione, then media. So, in regards to Hermione, uh, I let it slip that Ron and Harry get into a fight, and just as in Prisoner of Azkaban, where Hermione is taken out of... Wait, was that Azkaban? No, that was the other one. Ah, anyway. Um, she's actually taken out of play in both books towards the end. Anyway, Ron is taken out of play, as I say, all day, for some time, and he... Or that leaves Harry and Hermione to spend a lot of time together and to explore different aspects of their relationship as friends. And I thought it was lovely. I enjoyed seeing more of their interactions, and it was interesting to kind of separate Harry and Ron so that we could see different dynamics come to the fore. And I just thought it made it more interesting that there was that conflict, and then it resulted in the shifting of the dynamics, which was the same thing I thought when Hermione was taken out of play previously. So, that was cool. And... On the other side of that, I do like how the whole issue was resolved with Harry and Ron 
even if I thought their fight was a little silly. I liked the fight, but it was a little silly, and the resolution to it was basically spot on. I think it was excellently done. So, so I like that. Um, and talking about media, it's interesting that for some reason a Wizarding World journalist comes into the story and causes a lot of damage and uh, a lot of like even newspapers are used to convey useful and cogent and clear information to different people like Harry's Godfather and uh, there's somebody else maybe even Arthur Weasley no he, he doesn't directly do it but somebody else is said to have like seen the muggle newspapers how they're picking up on some things in the wizarding world in, relating to Voldemort and I like that I think it's interesting that like the media is brought in as another aspect even though I think today it's definitely overdone and oversaturated and I hope it doesn't continue too much throughout the other books um, it makes sense for this one now, I guess. Uh, I can concede it for this book, but if it carries on as like a huge aspect of it, I'm going to be, I don't know, a little irritated or, or less than thrilled about it, but that's okay. Uh, but there's a reporter, Rita Skeeter, uh, or Skeeter, who is particularly a particularly acrimonious media woman, and she's basically a liar and uh, libeler, and uh, because uh, when you say that a newspaperman is doing slander, he can simply respond to you that he objects to that because in print it's libel. Um, but anyway, she's a libelous, lying, scandal monger and an awful character, and I really dislike her. She plays an interesting role in the book, but it also is like a weird role, and I don't quite, you know, maybe this is Rowling setting up something for future books as she's want to do. And um, I can't remember specifically all the stuff because it was such a big book that she tied in from Azkaban to uh, Goblet of Fire. But I know there was stuff. So, um, yeah, that was really interesting. Yeah, it just made me... uh, uh, (laughs) It's interesting that Rowling, maybe inadvertently in the story, tells you to question and be careful, be wary of the media because sometimes they spread lies and say things just for their own benefit. And then... Uh, as time has gone on, she's been slandered in the media and, or, you know, libeled in the media. And, uh, I just kind of find that interesting. Um, but she does offer truths about that. But I don't know. It, it's interesting. There's a more nuanced conversation that needs to be had. But the character was, you know, very di- unlikable, very dislikable, uh, bordering on hateable. Um, and I don't know. Some of the stuff in the book could be considered fluff, but it's brought on by Rita Skeeta or Skeeter, whatever. Um, And I don't know, it might branch off into something that's more profound in the the following books, but uh, I don't know. It was just interesting. It was a really interesting, like, side thing that was in there for some reason and that was doing something there, and I didn't understand it. And I could see the utility in it, and it was enjoyable in some ways and very unenjoyable in others, uh, but I just kind of wonder what it was all about, so... I'm going to stop there. I'm not going to say too much more about it or the rest of the book. I liked the book. I thought it was very interesting. I liked that the stakes have been ratcheted up, and I'm actually going to go right into the next book, which I think is very long, and I don't have much more time until I have to return it to the uh, the cloud library that I'm borrowing it from. So, um, yeah, that's all I have to say for now, and I will let future me uh, wrap this up as well as you know, put an intro on it for this issue of uh, skimming leaves that this will be found in. So, until next time, folks, take care. This is MJ signing out. I hope you enjoyed that. Go to mjmunoz.com to leave any questions, comments, or other feedback you might have. There you can find all of my analysis, art, and fiction. I cover books, tokusatsu, comic books, anime, and more. Look around. You're sure to find something else that you'll enjoy as well. This has been a Story Over Everything production.